Good evening and welcome to the Dusty Feet, another night of our homework series. Jesus, <laughs> truth, and spin. Uh, it's the eighth episode in Mackie's uh, Matthew series, but our two-parter on this one. It's only two parts. We'll wrap this up tonight. In two weeks, we'll get on to the next one should be an interesting evening this evening but we'll we'll get to that and as always on the dusty feet this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of god interconnection of his creation where belief understandings may be challenged divine misunderstandings may exist and traditional teachings might falter as we pursue connection context and community with god and each other here in an environment of grace and love so here we go on the dusty feet Okay, so we're on part two. This will be fun. If you haven't, we're on part two of our part. So if you're watching this and you're not live, then my personal suggestion is that you pause, go to the link in the description, watch the video, and then I might suggest going and watching part one because that will be helpful when discussing part two. It just kind of, in case we bring anything up that has a context piece or something like that, at least you know where that's coming from. Again, link is in the d description. Um, so truth and spin, and what we're uh, starting to get here is that, is that, as Mackie had in the picture, the iceberg of what we give out as information and then what's really out underneath about us, okay? And that's the, the core that Jesus is getting to. Yeshua is talking to his audience, and he's going, okay, you've you, you got the bait, you got the ABCs, you got the one, two, threes, but it's time to act more mature. It's time for us to, the kingdom is coming, and these are the things that I expect as ways that we should live um, in his kingdom. That said, part of this here is he's talking about, and he said you've heard about sw swearing an oath, and he gets into the, the who's and the why's and the where's and the don'ts, and and it, the underlying part is the lack of truthfulness that goes when you do that, and the reputation that you drag underneath as you do okay so it'll be interesting as we continue this this will be the third clip and we'll see what Mackie has to say so let's get involved in that one and then we'll start our discussion pick up where we left off two weeks ago on part one here we go you have these laws given in ancient Israel don't use the name of God in your oaths so here's what happened um, people didn't use God's name in oaths anymore, but what they developed in Jesus' culture was a whole cultural practice and system of using other things that were associated with God but aren't the name of God. And so what, what, what can you swear by if you're not supposed to use the name of God? Jesus names a few things. You can swear by heaven. You can swear by earth. You can swear by Jerusalem. You can swear by your head. And then that created all these other debates and they exist in Jewish literature from the time of Jesus that we have. All these debates among the rabbis. Well, what counts as a genuine swearing an oath? And like, what do you really have to be sure you're telling the truth on if you're going to swear by this or something like that? And so there developed all of, all of these debates and discussions. Jesus alludes to this whole debate later on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 23. And you'll just, it'll, I think, be clear what, what he's getting at. So he's, he's getting on the Pharisees about... Uh, legalism and misplaced, misplaced priorities. And he says, so you Pharisees, you say, if someone swears by the temple, it means nothing. 
But anyone who swears by the gold in the temple, well, now they're bound by that oath. I swear by the temple, he stole my donkey. And then it turns out, oh, he didn't really steal the donkey. Well, at least I didn't swear by the gold in the temple. You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> whoa, you know, the gold in the temple. That's a different thing. So you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar, swears by this branch in the way, swears by it and everything on it. Anyone who swears by the temple, swears by it and the one who dwells in it. Anyone who swears by heaven, swears by God's throne and the one who, who sits on it. In other words, so there's developed this practice where, well, if I can't use God's name, I'll use things that are kind of associated with God, and that'll still accomplish the end goal, you know, which is to make people impressed and think that I'm for sure telling the truth. But in fact, by just trying to evade and use these like loophole things, you're actually still drawing on God's reputation. Because who made your head? Like, where'd you get your head from? You know, where is heaven? It's God's space. Where's earth? It's also God's space too. It's all God's. Anything that you could possibly swear by is a part of what God has authored in this wonderful, strange world that we call creation. And so we're always swearing by God's name, even if you think that you're not. And so what, here's what Jesus does. He, he wades into this, this labyrinth of debate and discussion about, like, you know, it happened the way I said it happened. I swear by the altar. And then you're, it's, you just left out a few facts, and you distorted some things. And you're like, well, at least I didn't swear by the gift on the altar, because that would, what kind of person would I be then? You know? And he just wades into this, and he just says, enough. It's just, in, in the kingdom, it's about simple, honest, truthful recognition and sharing and relationships. There's, there's something about this multiplication of words and, and what Jesus is exposing here is, is actually something that undermines and, co and corrodes our, our relationships. And there's, um, there's one commentator, uh, a guy named Dallas Willard, uh, whose book, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, which I absolutely recommend. We've recommended uh, Willard's book uh, before, once in a series we did in the summer. The Divine Conspiracy, at the heart of this book, is about a 200-page, just beautiful exploration uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing from beginning to end. It's absolutely profound. And his comments on this teaching of Jesus, I, I think he gets it right. Spot, spot on. He says this. He says, the essence of swearing that Jesus targets here, it's about invoking something or someone else, especially God, to make your words seem more significant and weighty. So the aim is to impress others with your seriousness or your piety so that you get what you want. It's a device of manipulation that's designed to override the judgment or input of others in order to possess them for our purposes. It's manipulation, or as we say in our culture, spin. And Jesus says it's evil. Instead of loving and honoring others with truthfulness, the intent is to get one's way by verbal manipulation of the thoughts and of the choices of others. How you guys doing? That's a dense, that's a very dense paragraph, but do you get what he's saying here? This is not, this is not just about first century Jewish culture and what you can swear by and so on. The root issue is that we present our yes and our no, we present ourselves to each other in, as false presentations. We're not, we don't live in ways that are truthful with each other. Instead, what we do, I love his, his analogy of, of generating spin, because 21st century America, you know what he's talking about, don't you? Spin. So, so Coca-Cola, they give you a commercial of children playing in a field, or like cuddling polar bears, or something like that. It's like, what is, the, what is that? We all know what's going on right there, right? They're using the positive emotions that you have associated with kids playing and wanting to cuddle up with a polar bear or whatever, and then associate it 
with their product. Well, they'll never, they'll never show what actually happens with Coca-Cola, which is like you have too much, and then it, you belch and it dribbles down your cheek or something like that, you know? And imagine the close-up of that. Like, that's obviously not what, what they're going to do. It's spin. And so it's not even that, like, Coca-Cola is not good or something like that. It's, it's the point of we're using someone or something else in this verbal smokescreen to somehow present me or myself or what I'm doing here in the best positive light, and it's putting on a show. It's putting on a show for each other. And Jesus says that absolutely runs against the core ethic of the kingdom, because when you're doing that, you're not honoring people's ability to actually like, maybe want to get to know you. You're not, you're not being honest and truthful about your own weaknesses or flaws. You're constantly clouding that out or whatever. It's about this false representation of ourselves to each other. And a community of human beings who are moving towards healthy, whole, loving relationships, this might actually be one of the greatest obstacles you can imagine to a community of healthy, loving relationships. This is the fact is that we're constantly hiding from each other through words, through verbal spin and, and smoke screen. Verbal spin and smoke screen. It's interesting uh, in this point that, that, that um, Mackie starts to make that uh, this is a problem that he's addressing then and today, I would say in our culture, it's off the chart, Richter scale, bad. Uh, I would like us to think about a couple of things. One, let's be lighthearted about this, but I've said it many times, we are them, they are us. Okay, We are them, they are us. And that's an interesting thought that, that I have with that for this reason. Sometimes we say, okay, so we're the, we're, we're the children in this scenario. In other words, we're, we're the audience that, that Jesus is talking to. And I go, sometimes, maybe, maybe we're that other side. We might be that pharisaical person that is blind. And he's trying to correct us. Okay? The challenges might be is that maybe the illusion is that the Pharisees at that point were not interested in being corrected. Again, that's a very broad stroke statement. Were there Pharisees in there that corrected themselves? We have Nicodemus is, is a great example. Okay, So we kind of need to think about uh, that all, or is it who's in power, or is it those things that let's not broad stroke everybody and throw everybody under the bus, both sides, okay? So remember, we are them, they are us. Let's keep that in mind when listening to any story, that you're not always on one side. <laughs> Just be careful about that. And a more important point. This is one thing that I wrote this down, that I'm going to mention it, and then there's a good chance I'm going to mention it again later, Okay. Here's the statement. What would it mean if our yes is yes and our no is no, that all of our speech would or should be considered, I'm going to create a word here, oathful, okay? Oathful. Today's world, we can make words up all the time. So I'm making up a word, oathful, okay? Um, what would, would that then cause us to maybe remove spin from our daily language. In other words, if everything we said, because we often say yes and no to all kinds of things, right? That isn't necessarily an oath. And I'm saying if we treated, if we took the time to treat our daily speech as if it were an oath, oathful, how would that change how we talked? If we are ambassadors to the king, if we're part and parcel of talking about his kingdom and what his kingdom looks like, one would think that we're not at the point that we're, oh, I didn't swear on anything or I, I'm not speaking of this now, so 
I don't have to be as, as truthful about this. But when I am speaking about this, and that's when I'm truthful. But the other time, I don't have to be because I'm not talking about it. For instance, if, if I'm not at church, then my I can be somebody different there than during the week because then I don't have to be truthful because I'm, I'm not at church with the God thing going on. And I'm saying, what if? What would it mean if our yes is yes and our no is no? That all of our speech would or should be considered oathful. Everything we talked about. Chew on that a bit. J just to m mull that a bit. Um, a swearing an oath on the Bible. When we do this, we, we bring God's reputation into disrepute. Especially as it's come to be known now. Okay, That it serves no weight. It's interesting, I would think, that even in our climb today, that we would stop doing that merely because it means nothing. Uh, we've had that name and that act so diluted, muddied, mucked up that it, it, it serves no value and no purpose to turn and say, well, it's more important to me than it is to them, but you both said the same thing. So I don't know which to believe, hence the question. So we've so sullied God's reputation in this and muddied this point of his, the words that are said. It's interesting, I would think that Jesus would have this conversation. He said, Yeshua said, you guys, um, can we be any more blind on this? How do we need to open our eyes and say, I've been doing this? The interesting part is, if I am truthful and faithful in this, and I have been up to this point, that if I were to get up on the stand and say those things, that that would be something that would just continue to flow. Your Honor, my yes is yes, my no is no. I'm as truthful out there as I am in here. Only your reputation and those of others can vouch for that. That's another discussion we're going to have in, in, in a bit. Um, he mentions simple, honest, truthful interaction and sharing in relationship. Can we do that? Can we do that? Simple, honest, truthful interaction and sharing in relationship. Dallas Willard's quote. I thought it was impactful. I want to bring it up again so you can look at it a little longer and you can always freeze it and take it down for yourself if it has impact to you. I know it was to me. The essence of swearing that Jesus targets here is about invoking something or someone else, especially God, to make your words seem more significant and weighty. The aim is to impress others with your seriousness or piety so that you get what you want. It's a divisive manipulation designed to override the judgment or input of others in order to possess them for our purposes. It's manipulation or as we say in our culture, spin. And Jesus says it's evil. Instead of loving and honoring others with truthfulness, the intent is to get one's way by verbal manipulation of the thoughts and choices of others. Dallas Willard, The Divine Conspiracy. I want to, again, like Mackie said, this, this, this is a dense, thick, to discussion of which we will scratch the surface at best here in this. But the purpose is to, as always here, <laughs> is to get us to think beyond this episode, to think beyond as you go through your week and ponder some of these things and what we can possibly do to change what we say and how we do things and how those are perceived, how those are perceived. The discussion of who we are. I, th I thought about this the other day. It was an interesting thought, if you could do this, if it was possible. If somebody said, tell me about yourself. Okay. To take spin out of the equation. If I could, I'd say, here's three people you can go talk to. 
because three people are not going to view you all identical or equal. And yet, if they described you, is it fair to say, I'd argue, that it is you? You may not like what you hear, but I would say that is you. Now, if you're lying and spinning, maybe it is you even worse. I don't know. I just wonder on those points when we can share that and say, here's three people, go ask them. They'll tell you who I am. And then your life be told, yes? Um, the interesting point in references, when you go to a job and get a reference, you, they want to know about you, your character. And so they'll talk. The longer you've known, one might say the more credible that reference is. Interesting thought. Something to chew on that would show an, an honesty of, of what you're doing. Um, and maybe even a little transparency on these are the way, the way people see me. Okay, so let's jump on to this next one because this is where we start chewing on some stuff more. I thought that was chewing. We're going to get into some more detailed uh, options to chat about and consider. So here's video two. Um, this is not just about first century oath practices in Judaism. This is about a habit that we all, all of us, do in, in some way. So how many of you have been in a conversation before and you begin to notice this pattern of like how this person talks. And what they do is they mention the people that they're friends with. And those people are maybe like impressive or important or influential people, and they just kind of like weave it into their speech, and it's just kind of how they operate. I was with so-and-so last week, or, you know, I was really thinking about this thing. Actually, you know who I was talking about it with was this person, you know, this kind of thing. And you guys know what I'm talking about here. And it's sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's quite awkward, maybe if they're not very self-aware or something. What's happening in that moment? So what's happening is, because in that moment, it's, it might be. I mean, it just might be. Odds are, it might be 50-50 or something. But like they really love and they want you to appreciate that person for who they are. But odds are, what's happening is that they're name dropping and they're actually using that person. Right? They're not honoring them as a fully orb, divine image bearing human being. They're using their, like, reputation and borrowing from it to somehow bolster and, and fill in gaps that I perceive in how you think about me and so I want to become, come across as more impressive or whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about here. Um, we, do it, we do it through embellishment. So stories about ourselves or stories, um, you know, you move to a new place. There's a lot of people around Dorf uh, who are new to town and so it's, a, you know, moving to a new place, beginning new relationships, it's kind of this it's kind of awesome, but also really precarious in a way because you can present a version of yourself that might be totally different than the version of yourself that you just moved away from, you know? And so, and as you get, as you present yourselves in these new relationships, it's this opportunity to tell your story, to tell about who you are. And we all have this tendency to, to do what? To smoke screen and to, you know, like, to, well, you can use grandpa's fish that, like, when I was five, it was a one foot long salmon that he caught, and then when I was 10, it was somehow eight feet long or something. How did that happen, right? In the story, Grandpa's story about the fish. But that's a silly example of things that we all do. We, we airbrush the, uh, the presentation of ourselves. We might use other people to do it and, and use from their reputation. It might just be through verbal s smoke screen, right? And that's what I think, that's what so, seems to us so silly. We look at this practice and it's like, what, the gold and on the altar in the temple? These silly, primitive, ancient people, you know, don't they know how to be human beings? And it's, <laughs> and it's such arrogance and ignorance on our part. This is a human thing. There's something deep within us that we actually use our words. Jesus is talking about how we use words. We use our words to hide from each other and to deceive each other. And it might even be so deeply rooted, like the iceberg 
is, goes so deep, we don't actually even know that we do it anymore. But you might catch yourself. There's a moment in which there's something, you, you bailed, there's something, you dropped the ball, or you did something where you blew it, and then someone asks you about it, or they catch you on it, and in that moment, you have a chance. Do you, truthful? Yeah, I did that. I forgot. That was lame. I shouldn't, you know? Or do you, like, spin a paragraph that the person doesn't actually even know what you just said, but you think, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, man, I didn't say this at the nine, but I'll say it, I'll say it right now. Uh, one of my earliest experiences, uh, I was most of the way through my, my PhD at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, and I had a friend who was the director of the Association of Funeral Directors for the state of Wisconsin. And so he asked me to come give this talk on like Jewish views of burial and life after death and so on. And so I'm, I'm in a room full of 300 funeral directors. Imagine how that meeting goes. You know what I'm saying? And, and I remember this one guy asked a question about some archaeology thing of ancient Jewish tombs or whatever, and I didn't know the answer. I just straight up didn't, didn't know. I knew a bunch of other stuff that I brought to share, but I didn't know the answer to that thing. And what I did was not the right thing to do. What I did is just start blabbering. And, and I got about a minute into it, and I was realizing, like, I don't know the answer to what he's talking about. I don't even know what's coming out of my mouth right now, but they're all... And I began to realize, like, I think, they're, I think they know that I don't know what I'm talking about right now. 300 funeral directors. And so I just had to stop myself and just be like, dude, you know what? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm really sorry. I just, uh, you know, there's some things that I thought might be helpful, but I just, I, I don't know. And it was one of those moments where, like, public speaking nightmare, you know, I'm sure I blushed and my body temperature raised 40 degrees or whatever. But it was, for me, personally, that's, and I remember that experience so vividly because of the strong emotions of shame that I felt because I was trying to hide. Instead of just, no, I don't know, <laughs> I felt the need because here I am, need to be perceived, and I need to manage how these people think about me, and so I'm going to come up with something to present myself as something other than what I actually am, somebody who doesn't know that much about 7th century burial tombs in ancient Israel. You know what I'm saying? Like, why do I need to be that guy who knows that? But apparently I thought I did for about 60 seconds. You know? <laughs> right? And so that's my geek version or whatever. But you guys, know what, you guys know what I'm talking about here. You know what I'm talking about. And so what... What's wrong with us? <laughs> and these are just non-religious examples. Jesus is giving ways that we use God language of doing this. Because this is all about using God's name and using our own you know, religious vocabulary to do, this very, to do this very thing. How many of you have been in a conversation with someone and uh, they're a Christian and they're talking to you about like a decision that they've made you know, or something that they've chosen to do? And they'll use language like, I've really, I've really been praying about this, and um, I feel like God's called me to it. Um, or they might even say, you know, I have a real peace about this. You know, you know the peace one, I like that one, I have a peace. Because you would never say that about, I have a peace about eating this hamburger. You would never say, you would never say that, but when, I have a peace about moving here or doing this. Anyway, so, so what's happening right there? It could be that that person is really like honest, searching. They have been praying for a long time and they've been talking to other people who are wise and getting their input and check my motives and, you know, reflect on the scriptures. And so they've, I hear I'm going to do this thing. But they, you know, if you've been in this conversation, you know that there are other times where it's like, if they were really honest, it's like, yeah, I kind of like, I don't know, I prayed once in the last week about this thing. And, and the, to, to say I've been praying about this, God's called me to it, for some people is actually a way of like putting up a wall and shutting down the conversation because they don't want your opinion right? <laughs> or input. And then it's sort of like the God called me trump card. You know, who's going to say no to that? God called me to do this. You know, oh, the trump, you know, the God called them. Like, what can I say? You know, and it's very, it's murky. I understand. But what's, what's at the root issue there? For some of us, we use religious language. We use Jesus. And what we're actually, we're not honoring and loving Jesus, we're just using him as a way to somehow make my own agenda or decision seem more holy or sanctified. And because it's important that I come across that way in my church community. We do, we do, we do it all the time. And I think the most, the most tragic 
use of God language to do this is when a, a, a church community of people can do this or the leadership of a church community can somehow convince itself or whatever, it has good plans or whatever, but there's something that happens even on leadership teams within churches where we begin to use Jesus and Jesus' language to just put like the, the stamp, it's holy, right, and good on like our five-year plan for our church and what we're going to... You guys know what I'm talking about here. And I say that fully knowing the position that I'm in right now as I, as I say that. And it's actually that issue, the sharing personally, it's that issue that for me gives me an extremely conflicted relationship with what I'm doing this very second, right? Because I, part of it is I, just growing up skateboarder in Portland, I just am still have this thing in me, stick it to the man. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so I re recognize in some ways, ironically, I have a job where I kind of like represent the man or something like that, you know, and in the form of a church or whatever. I don't know. But, and I don't. It's, it's, a, it's a team of us who do it. But, but I'm so scared of that. And all the elders are, and Josh is too. It, it's this, this ways that you can convince yourself of that your own deal is so important that you begin to use Jesus to airbrush your deal, and then you actually don't want the input of other people, and you're just trying to present it as good as you possibly can so that because you can get people to do what you want. <laughs> it's much easier to control people than to love them and to honor them and their dignity and their, and their input. Ouch. Ouch. Um, name dropping, using that person, not honoring them or borrowing from their reputation, stealing. So it's probably fair for me to say at this point that when we use Skip and Mackey and, and Foreman, that one, they're by permission, but two, that... I try to make sure that you have all the information, the original conversations. I'm not taking things out of context. I'm not looking to manipulate what they're saying to fit some agenda that I have. I'll share my parts and they've shared their parts and then you get to sit around and discuss. Links are in the description, pieces over, so you can go and check that stuff out because I never want to be part of that taking from someone else their hard work, their stuff, and also saying that because we talk about Mackie that my words mean more or do more. So please let that not be in a prayer of mine, that that not be the, the, the case. Uh, that said, have I in the past and all this stuff, I'll share a brutal story of myself uh, two ways. Let's take the first one. As a child, and growing up, I had my uh, my other my cousins, okay, and they were wonderful group of cousins, absolutely brilliant, okay, and they were so much fun. Had the deal, and my reputation as a kid, again, ask my mom and dad, ask other people about this, right? That to them, Bob knew everything because I always had an answer, always had an answer. Bob knew everything. They got an answer. Bob would come up with something. I came, I had answers for all kinds of stuff. That Mackie, talking to one group, commits to do that. I did that for my entire childhood. And if I could go back, grab them all, put them all in a room, take them out to lunch, have some enjoyable time, and go, confession time, Bob doesn't know everything. Nor did he. Maybe I can ask for your forgiveness. Because that's a that's a brutal piece brutal piece of honesty on for me, and and something that I definitely did. It was very much a part of Bob for a, a while. Um, so a more positive spin on something uh, with my soccer. I had the opportunity to represent S South Carolina at the Olympic Development P Program. Uh, they had a. a tournament and some things going on in um, Montgomery, Alabama, I believe it was. And I got a chance there to meet a very special guy someday. I'll, I've, I've talked about him, uh, Armando Villarreal, and people that that live to to what what somebody might say is a, a 
um, potential. Harsh to say expectation, but somebody do this. But at this tournament, um, I, I show up and the instructor in the tournament happened to be a, a pro referee that I had worked with a number of times uh, in the past. One of my favorite guys, very much like my personality, very talky, uh, very personal with the refs, uh, and worked hard on the relationship side of things that, that was part and parcel to, to, to my game. So Mark's teaching, Mark Catalastic is teaching, and I'm one of the students in there. And Mark said, I'm actually thrilled you're here because I can't believe this, um, this is going to happen. You'll find out. So Mark and I talked about it. We end up in class. So we have field sessions and class sessions. We get in the classroom. So Mark starts to pull up some video clips for training. And there's always video clips where they'll show something. And then we get to discuss like we do here. We'll show a clip and we'll discuss it. We'll talk about something. So in this particular one, he clips. And he looks at me and he says, Bobby, you're going to remember this. And he pulls up a game, a battery game, where I'm fourth official. And he's in the middle. And as the clip unfolds, in my head, I go, oh, my gosh, I remember this. It was one of those deals. And it's a tackle, ugly tackle. Okay, And we have very nonverbal signals that we give in this. So, um, so he's going, so I'm not having to talk to him. Right now, we have headsets. The referees have had have, we haven't actively refed in a number of years. But even back then, I, I had headsets before I retired but didn't at the time that Mark was doing it. So it was all very nonverbal hand signals, things that to be very subtle. So when you thought that there was something that needed to be done, like a, like a booking, a card, you'd pat your front pocket for uh, a caution, and you'd tap your back pocket for a red, for a, a send-off. So this tackle goes over. I look at Mark. We make eye contact, and I pat my front pocket. I go, we need to book this guy. This is just not... I'm, I'm, I'm reading the... The tension on the benches, it's right in front, blah, 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 blah. And Mark looks and ignores it and just has a little talk and goes. And I can tell they're not happy with the justice. They wanted to see some more justice. So Mark tells the clip and he goes, they'd have done this. Did you catch what Bob did? And you saw it. And you see me not take his recommendation. X minutes later, he shows another clip. And it shows this ugly, ugly tackle in the deal. And he says, and both of us agreed, that was retaliation for the one we didn't deal with before. And then we had this wonderful talk to talk about it and all this kind of fun. And we got a chance to have this discussion. The cool part was we're showing clips that is our mistake. And we had a chance to share it in that mode. This is us. We're not having to show a clip from some other guy from an MLS game or, or, or some other game that's going on in, in those pieces. We got to talk about us and, and our mistakes and where we fell short and where we didn't do our job and the disjustice it did to the community. In that part, the community happens to be a soccer pitch. Those are those things that we talk about. Can we talk about those things and say, this was my fault and my failure? In the, in the locker rooms after our games, we would sit and the assessor would come in and with brutal honesty, he would ask you, how did you do? The assessor's asking the, 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 the guy in the middle. Okay, turn and tell you, oh, I had a great game. This was really fun. I had a good time. It's time to be honest. It's time to be somewhat brutally honest with yourself. Not, not, not my best game. I, I uh, tried to do some things. I lost control for a little bit. I had to bring the control back, raise the tensions with the players. And we're sharing this with the team as they're there and we're learning and we're growing with it. Can we do that together? Can we do that in our community together? Start with the small groups, like in the soccer game, we had this, the, the four inside the, the locker room. And we talked about those mistakes in the locker room. But how often you could take those mistakes you take in the locker room and take them to a class. You take them from a class and you realize that, say, I brought it to by a local group and we talked to our local group. But when we go with the Olympic Development Program, that those people are from the region, the region three area of, of 
the um, southeastern United States. So then that story goes out past there. So that honesty in this deal goes. Again, how do people describe you versus you describing yourself? Um, how does that story grow? How do we airbrush that? The fish, the fish, the fish, the fish, the fish. The, the bigger the story, the bigger the fish, yeah? And can we be honest? There are times in stories that I have and they go back in my head. And I, I, sometimes I wonder, do I even really remember the truth of the, of the story? It's true. You'll airbrush some story and you'll do some things and you'll even really forget what the real crux of what it was and what you could learn to where you could have grown and how you could share and teach somebody else. To, sh to share with somebody an airbrush story, I think is disingenuous. I do. I think it's disingenuous. I think that if we're going to share true stories and share true stuff, that you share the other story. That you share it and how, how it meets you. Um, and even like, such arrogance and ignorance uh, on our parts when we don't. Such arrogance and ignorance on our parts when we don't. Um, and that very uncomfortable part that he started to talk about is that that bringing, I talked about it, I prayed about it, I'm at peace with it, discussion about what we do in whatever we do, church, life, whatever, when we share in those conversations, are we truthful in that? Are we looking to shut down a conversation? If I say that, then you're not going to ask all the questions and, well, well, and I, and then, or I can't question what you do. You say, well, I think it's so there's no discussion. You're not seeking counsel or doing those things. And I'd be, I think it's scary probably how many times that happens, that it, it is used as a cover. And that's a bit sad. How do we do that? How do we change that? How are we willing to say, hey, this is an idea. God has prepared us for this. Me, given me life. The experiences that I go through. I made this choice to do this. Play out. Let that be the choice that was there. I'm not throwing God under the bus by going, well, if it doesn't work, it's God's fault because obviously God told me to do this. So, and then what, what do you do if it doesn't? Then, well, God must have meant something else to happen. Are we even willing to have that discussion? If we said that and then down the road something changes, are we even willing to sit back and take the question from somebody. I thought I heard you say this, and this comes out. Any thoughts? Any ideas? It's fair, and I think we don't. We we'll push that out in 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 heartbeat, and we miss a lot of that. Um, putting God's stamp on things and giving God's endorsement. We're we're so good to sign God's name to the bottom of our idea, or our plan, or our thought, or our whatever we we sign God's name to the bottom and people go oh God's name's on it so I I, I I can't question it um and the line it's much easier to control people than it is to love them and to honor them to allow them to disagree with your train of thought I think that's what I've enjoyed the most of late is is having those discussions with people that disagree. I actually, it, it, it's, it's re refreshing to have that. Um, and then find those that you can have that relationship with and still go out and have a meal afterwards, right? That's a mature section, I, I hope it is, in, in that thought. So I want to... Um, play this last one, this will almost wrap stuff up because what he says in here really puts a nice 
uh, touch, bow, topping to, to this discussion. It really helps focus us on, on um, maybe what we can think about and the challenges that we might have with it and how to go from here. So let's listen to the last clip. And, and so um, I don't actually think this is one of those Sundays where you're like, I'm doing good on this one, you know? Because like, I haven't sworn an oath recently, you know? Um, this is obviously much, much, much deeper. It's way deeper. So why, uh, why do we do this? Like, what is actually, what kind of inner transformation does it take to get to a place where my presentation of myself and my purposes is just simple and, and honest? <laughs> I don't feel the need to create the smoke screen. How, how do I get there? How does anyone get there? And it seems to me that that's what Jesus is trying to get us to reflect on with this last line here. What kind of person does it take, or what kind of person do I need to become so that I can not feel the need to hide from you with my words? So that my yes, is a tr my words are truly correspond to who I really am, and I don't feel the need to, to cover it up. And actually, I think it's that verbal cover-up that Jesus exposes here that I think really gets to, to the issue. Is that somehow with words with just blabbing or talking or using Jesus language or name dropping or other people, what we're doing is we're hiding from each other. We're, we're hiding the truth about who we are. And what is that truth? And I think it's the, it's the same truth that some of you learned about the playground bully, you know, in grade school. And they're just a jerk. You know, they're just such a jerk and oppressive. You know, they'd steal your milk money or something like that. I don't just, People don't have milk money anymore. Maybe they do. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so you have the school, you have like the, the playground bully, and like they're a jerk and you, you don't like them, but some of us, somewhere along the way, you know, they stayed in school alongside you in high school, and you learned, you learned their story. And what you learned was that their life at home was just a wreck, absolute wreck. And like overbearing jerk dad who never affirms them if he's around at all and like tense anxious mom and so on and so what what your playground bully is actually doing is he's compensating he's compensating for a deep fear and insecurity that they have and so how do they compensate they compensate by either bullying you controlling manipulating you or presenting some version of themselves that isn't actually true because dude if anyone actually knew about what like my life is like and the kind of person i really am no one would want to be my friend is fear is fear what, what is a smokescreen designed to do it's the, it hides and so it's the tragic irony of human communities is that we want more than anything to know and to be known by each other, but we're perpetually hiding from each other by how we spin, generate spin around ourselves. And for you, it may not be swearing oaths, it may not be polar bears and children playing in a field, but we all do it. We all know what Jesus is, is highlighting and exposing right here. And so how do you get around that, <laughs> right? How do you address your fear of just being totally insignificant and unimportant. <laughs> That's a deep iceberg, all right? How do you address your fear of people actually knowing the, the real you and the flaws in your character and the parts of your story that you're not proud of? Like, how do you do that? And there's a, a theme woven throughout the New Testament. There's one passage in particular that I think is, is like the answer or the corresponding passage to what Jesus raises right here. And uh, it's in 1 John chapter 4, but just what it highlights is I, I just want us to think about who's Jesus and what's he doing? How does Jesus think he's addressing this issue? And remember, what is he doing? He's going around inaugurating and announcing the kingdom. He's, he's throwing these dinner parties and inviting all of the wrong people, people who have been written off by their religious community, and he just invites them to these banquets where he just celebrates God's grace and forgiveness he, is Jesus making the first move and just moving right into people's worlds and lives and just announcing forgiveness and grace and an invitation to come into the family of Jesus' people? 
And as the, the apostles and the disciples later reflected on what Jesus was doing, there is one word woven throughout the entire New Testament that the disciples came to describe what Jesus was doing. And this passage puts it, puts it beautifully. John says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You see, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So as the disciples looked back and reflected on their encounters with Jesus as he inaugurated the kingdom. The word they used to describe everything about Jesus and what he did was love. Jesus was God's love among us. Jesus was God's love that went and found people who were hiding and distorted and screwed up human beings like we all are, and just made this ridiculous offer <laughs> that, that Jesus' life lived as a human being full of integrity and truth is being offered to us just as a free gift, which is what he means when he says that we might live through him. Somehow, in John's conception, as we go around hiding through smoke screens from each other, we're, actually, what we're, just, we're living dead people because we don't want to be known, we're scared of being known, we don't ever let people in, we don't actually have relationships where we let anybody in, and, and, and John calls that a form of living death. You're living, but you're not really living for what God made you for. And so, and so Jesus comes as this human who actually is that kind of human. And he begins an association of people who he's beginning to remake and heal that part of them. And so we live through him. And not only that, is that not that we loved God first, but that in his death, and that was his life, and then his death, he actually covers over all of the huge messes that we make and that we contribute to this world precisely through all of our lying and deception of each other. I mean, the world is what it is because of all of these broken things about us. And so God's, God's purpose is not to like just let us go to hell in a handbasket. His whole point is to come among us and actually do something that addresses the, the core issues inside of us. And it's love. It's just preemptive, unconditional, like God didn't ask us if he wanted Jesus to come, but he just came among us in Jesus and did this for us. And here's the result. This is later on in the paragraph. And this, this couple lines here, I commend them to you for many cups of tea and lots of time reflecting on. As John says this in conclusion. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. See, fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not yet reached perfection in love. So one of the results in a disciple of Jesus, and when they truly reckon with who Jesus is and see what Jesus is doing as God's love for them, is, is it diminishes fear. What is it that causes us to hide from each other? Fear of being known, insecurity about my worth and my value and so on. And there's something John says about God's love, which isn't like a mysterious, vaporous cloud out in the universe. <laughs> God's love is a concrete, real person, Jesus of Nazareth, who did and said these things on our behalf, if you're willing to accept that. And, and in that act of love, it's God's permanent commitment to us, despite our deepest flaws and sins and failures, that he's committed to us, and that he sees value and worth in us as divine image-bearing humans and that we're full of all this remarkable capacity and potential that we're just totally have distorted. And so he's here to, to redeem that, literally. And to begin to believe that about yourself. I mean, just, I know it's like theology or whatever, so just stop. Do you actually believe that about yourself? Right? There are things that you've never let anybody know about, like secrets or stupid things that you've done or things that you're ashamed of or things that you're embarrassed of about yourself. Do you, actually, do you really believe that those things do not determine your value or worth? Do you really believe that, that your creator, the, the most important being that exists, has already demonstrated his preemptive initiating love and grace for you? And John says if you can 
Get that truth deep, deep in your bones and in your mind and in your heart. It eliminates fear. Fear. Because fear has to do with God's actually like out to get me. No, Jesus has proved that wrong. Fear has to do with people are constantly evaluating what about if what they think about me, you know, and then I'm, I'm not significant if those people don't think a certain thing about me. And it seems to me what John's getting at is like, if you really reckon with who Jesus is, who, who cares what people think about you? Who actually cares what people think about you? Not in a bad way, but in a healthy way. Because your identity is not determined by what other people think about you. It's determined by this act of Jesus right here. And so it seems to me that the only way to address the, the deep, huge scope of what's underneath the surface of this iceberg, lying is just the tip, and this verbal smokescreen is just the tip of the iceberg. This is the issue, and it seems to me this is how Jesus moves towards us yeah, in it. Like Mackie said at one point, I commit you to many cups of tea as you ponder this. Grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab your Coke, whatever, right? And ponder some of this. Find some people to talk about this with, with that. Um, wh 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 why do we do this? Spin, right? And how can, now it's an interesting phrase. So picture how I word this. How can I feel the need not to hide from you? How can I feel the need not to hide from you? I need to not hide from you. I need to be honest and out there. Because in that, there's a, 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 a freedom. Uh, that playground bully. I know these. You're compensating for something. And then you f we find this out years later, years later. And you go, oh, and if you could find that guy or gal and hug him, it's just a different deal. Um, so a friend of mine recently came out, Tommy. Wilson will be and he shares his story and I knew a little bit about his story and then he told the story to the men's group at a men's getaway and he decided to go out and the fear that was there but I also would like to ask Tommy the question, and that's why I want to have him on the show again to talk about it with this, to talk about this this particular event with him, because this is a living example of this. Wilby decides to um, share this with the, the men's group, maybe feeling the love in this. There's fear in it, but also God's telling him it's time for you to start sharing and this is a safe group to do that with. He has a positive response and a positive event and a release. Maybe more of, maybe he really can be who dot, 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 okay? And then he goes and gives the same testimony in front of the group, in front of the Vine community. So he stretches it even more. Okay, and it's an amazing testimony that he shares. And the fear and the value that, that we would feel less about him or powerful for him sharing his story. When the reality was, it was exactly the opposite. It was exactly the opposite. Now, I'll say this. Sharing this kind of place in a safe place is very important. To share those, those that love you is a, is a safer place to, to do that. 
And then God gets to express some of his love for you with these people. That they get to be part of that love expression that God has because God says, this is how part of how I express myself. And I get to use my community to, to do it. Um, hopefully, it's up to him. I'd like to have Wilby Wilson, a.k.a. Tommy, right? Um, and I will be on here and talk about this exact deal where he was tired of spin and, and, and tired of not and dealing and pushing this out. Like he said, the iceberg underneath, right? And we got a chance to maybe flip it. Maybe there's more ice on top and less ice on the bottom now with Wilby. Maybe, maybe that's it. That or more of that iceberg came to the surface. And you got to see more. And we got to see this grandeur that is this beautiful, giant white and blue iceberg. So may we get to, to, to that point. I think I'm going to start something new on Dusty. We're going to try it to, tonight to wrap things up. I'm starting to read some more poetry uh, to help develop my creative and uh, feeling side of things, which I need work on. And uh, matter of fact, I had a, uh, um, I got the book, S S Skip Moen just published his latest book. It's called Broken Pieces. And he's been writing poetry for like 50 years, but he's never published. This is his putting it out there when he published this. And uh, I joke, it's, he, he just got it. We, we got told in. And so I, I, I ordered it, came in the mail. And because of the heat here in the South um, and the mailbox, it was still warm in the package. And I showed it to Heather and I went, oh, Heather, look. And I took it off and I put it up against her cheek. Look, still hot off the press. The book is still warm. So it was one of those fun things. So poetry, I think, is something we'll be closing with for, for, for fun. I'm trying this. Um, so tonight won't be Skip. It'll be somebody else. Actually, it's an unknown. But it hit me in, in, an, in an interesting way. So I'd like to share it. So, here's the poem. How to tell time. Now, like manna, is perfectly sufficient and will rot is stored. And with that, thanks for spending the evening with us tonight on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>